Okay, so um, so can you get yeah, in, in complete sentences again? Like, can you just talk about you first read Heidegger? Who yeah. Heidegger is right. Uh, yes. Wrote. Okay. At the same time that I was reading Merleau Ponty in Professor Wilde's living room, uh, he Heidegger. Merleau Ponty was translated, so it was accessible. Heidegger had, never, had not been translated, Being in Time, which is his most important book, published in Germany in 1927, was still not available in English when I was a graduate student in the 50s, uh, which is, in retrospect, an amazing fact, because I think more and more people agree that that was the great philosophy book of the uh, uh, 20th century. Even enemies of Heidegger who think his later work is bad, uh, a famous philosopher named Jürgen Habermas still says that the being in time of Heidegger is the greatest philosophy book since Hegel, which is way back in 18-something. So, uh, so anyway, I read it, and I, I mean, no, I well, I, I, yes, I read it as best I could in, the, in German. And I understood enough to see that it, I just thought it was true, that it was an amazingly good description of our f way of being in the world, as, with hyphens as he writes it, meaning that we are just completely absorbed in dealing with the things that are around us in a way that it, when it's going well, there's no ego in it and there's no private stuff going on in my mind. It's all out there in the world which shows up as familiar and as sort of drawing me to do whatever needs to be done. Uh, I, 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 we're going to touch a lot on this, but yeah. of course the instinctual reaction, at least I think for someone who's not a philosopher, says, well, I have a brain and it's in my, inside my head and I have I do have personal experiences, even when I am interacting with the world, I experience it as me, you know, I'm going to school, or I'm thinking about this, or I'm, uh, so how is Heidegger's description on the most okay. superficial okay. level different from that? That's funny. I thought you were going to say the opposite. Why is Heidegger and you bothering to say all this, that we are open heads turned toward the world? It's so obvious. How could anybody have missed it? But instead, you're saying there are two good philosophical reasons that Descartes came up with to, to try to overthrow this view and make, it, make this inner seem important. So there are two inners. There's the brain, which is in my skull, and that's just irrelevant to this discussion because we're, we're discussing the, the phenomena. That is, yes, there's a brain, and yes, it's the causal basis of my experience, but I don't experience my brain, and I'm not my brain. It's just they're doing the, it's the plumbing doing the work that enables me to what? Well, the next thing is to say, well, to have private experiences, which I'm having all the time when I'm dealing with the world. And the answer to that is that more striking in Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, no, you don't have private experiences. You have experiences of that wall and those people and so forth. That when you're in really absorbed in what you're doing, which is a lot of the time, you just disappear. As, as what does Sartre say? The, my ego, he's, he talks about chasing a bus and desperately trying to catch it as, it as it pulls away. And he says, there is this attraction, this experience of, not even experience, there is the bus to be ta caught. And, and me, uh, my ego has disappeared. And that's the way we are a lot of the time. It took, it's interesting and important to realize that it took a lot of effort to get people to think that they were an ego with these inner experiences. Even, like you say, at least I'm having inner experiences at the same time I'm open to the world. That, and the stages, I'll mention two which are fascinating. That, I mean, how hard it was for people to think that way, because it's sort of wrong, really. I mean, it does happen that people have inner experiences. They have private moods sometimes, though mostly their moods are shared, like the mood at the party or the mood in the room. They have private uh, sort of uh, experiences when things are going wrong. So then they start worrying, how am I going to do this? But generally, they're just absorbed in what's going on. Now, in Homer, it starts already to be interesting that maybe there is some kind of inner. So Homer talks about Odysseus, who has this peculiar capacity 
that, that the, being this very special sort of super person, that he can cry inwardly while his eyes remain dry as bone. And that's because apparently all the rest of the Greeks were, and it's true, the soldiers seem to be crying all the time over their dead friends and so forth. The, and, and at parties, dinner parties where they sang of the Trojan War, they were all in tears. But there was, there was a way to have an inner experience of sadness and not show it. And that was news. And, but the most interesting news was St. Jerome in, I don't know, roughly 300 AD. Augustine in his confession says that people came from miles around to watch St. Jerome read the Bible. Why would anybody do that? Because of the amazing fact that his lips didn't move and he was silent. The meaning was going directly from the pages into the privacy of his mind. And this is Augustine trying to convince people that there really is an inner, and that's where all the things that are important are going on. But I just say, tell you this because it's once upon a time it wasn't obvious that I had, it, you had, we had inner experiences accompanying our skillful action. But people had, I mean, obviously people had emotions all along. People felt happy or sad or afraid or... Well, people had emotions, all right. And they, and now they felt happy, sad. Well, somebody like Sartre or Merleau-Ponty or Heidegger, these are the three anti-Cartesian people of the middle of the last century. They would all say things looked sad. They didn't have an inner feeling of sad. Everything looked gray or depressing or something, or everything looked like it was challenging and bright and full of possibilities. It's only if they reflected on it or if, they, if, their, if their feelings were out of sync with everything and they were in depression or something, then they would have inner feelings. But normally that things look uh, sad and attractive and uh, challenging and uh, frightening and all that. Things look that way, and it's just a kind of Cartesian idea that uh, that's because you're having this inner experience of fright. Uh, okay, so, but you, these are all the right things to object, and it's hard work, and really hard work for Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty and Sartre and now me to uh, work their way out of these Cartesian views that, that Augustine sort of started and Descartes perfected. So let's talk about how, how, how Heidegger went about doing that and being in time because uh, he started with the very fundamental human activities, right? Very simple things. That's how we right. In the world. So can you just go through a that's right. well, his, his, what his mission was and how he, I mean, we've been through his mission. How did he actually go about that's right. This? Of what course. Was of, how did he go about overthrowing Husserl? It's sort of funny that he said in a le lecture that. But in let's not talk about overthrowing Husserl because that's a little too technical and specific. Let's say uh, talk about overthrowing this whole law Cartesian tradition. thing. Okay. How did he go about that? Well, with very simple examples and, and down to earth examples, but he writes a lot about hammering, and he just as an example of the use of equipment. His big breakthrough is to talk about our basic way of being in the world as users of equipment. No philosopher had paid any attention to the fact that we sit in chairs and go outdoors and walk on floors and, and generally are surrounded by and co constantly skillfully dealing with equipment. So he took hammering and he pointed out that when the hammering is going well, the hammer become, withdraws in his language, becomes invisible and you are just a, sort of, as he would say, sort of poured into the, the work uh, that, that you're doing. And even that, if you're very skillful, you could just, at your best, you would just sort of phase out and be in the flow of doing it without you or the hammer being anything that you're thinking about. And, any, and there's no you thinking about it. There's just hammering going on. And, and so I'm going to keep insisting on the, the, the mainstream way of looking at that would be that you are unconsciously, uh, you know, thinking about using the hammer, right? Yes, and that's, that's a, fa a familiar and fascinating move. And that the move is, uh, yes, to try to say, well, if this isn't the sort of conscious phenomena that we, I, I'm describing, then it must be unconscious. That's like a kind of 
joke which I like to tell when, when, I, when, I, when I confront this, and I confront it all the time and did at MIT where the computer people would always say, well, it's going on in, in, in our minds and, and in our brains, but we don't have to be conscious of it. Okay, consider the following, I mean, and, and a typical example was, I learned to tie my shoelaces by following some rule, this over that, and then this loop, and then through that, I don't know the rule anymore, but I can still tie my shoelaces, so I must be unconsciously following that rule. And I say that's like a, a bad joke. Suppose you say, when I learned to ride a bicycle, I had to use training wheels. And if I didn't have my training wheels on my bicycle, I couldn't ride it. Now I seem to be riding around, now that I've had some experience, without any training wheels. My training wheels must be invisible. Uh, that is because they're necessary. For, so that's the same. So I must still be using that rule to tie my shoelaces. And what else then? Well, maybe there's an entirely different way the brain does it. Maybe it's just that each particular, ex after a lot of experience with any skillful thing, to sh let's stick to shoelaces, each stage, when it's like this, then it looks like it's drawing me to do that, and when it's got in that stage, it draws me to do that, and if I just respond to each thing as it comes along and do what I'm attracted to do, voila, the shoelace gets tied, Something in the brain is causing it, but it isn't the brain operating with rules. It's the brain being what they now think call a neural network. And yes, the neurons are all connected. And when you learn enough shoelace tying, the connections get changed so that finally, when there's an input of this kind of stage of shoelace tying, there's an output of that kind of movement of the next stage. So, and so the, what the moral is, the training wheels aren't invisible. One mode of processing, of doing things, has been replaced by another entirely different mode of doing things. And that's why you can now ride the bike flexibly and easily without any training wheels. And now make the big generalization. All the skills that you're learning you have to, or many of them, you have to learn consciously. And that gives you the impression that you're still following those 